Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mary Jane Fonder? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Mary Jane Fonder was born on July 5, 1942, and was raised in Philadelphia. Her father, Edward, was a machinist, and her mother, Alice, worked as a proofreader. Mary Jane had one older brother. When she was eight years old, her family purchased a cabin on 11 acres in Springfield Township, Pennsylvania. This is in Bucks County, about an hour and a half north of Philadelphia. In 1981, her parents relocated to Springfield Township, but Mary Jane stayed in Philadelphia. She worked for many different places, including a department store, a few different knitting factories, and a publishing company. In 1987, Mary Jane moved to Springfield Township. She lived in her parents' house on Winding Road in Kintersville and took care of them because they both suffered from various medical problems. On September 7, 1992, Mary Jane's mother, Alice, died. This caused a lot of tension in Mary Jane's relationship with her father because he was depressed by the loss. On August 26, 1993, Mary Jane called 911 and said that her 80-year-old father, Edward, had walked outside to get the newspaper off the driveway and never returned. An extensive search was conducted, but there was no sign of Edward. The police suspected that Mary Jane was involved in his disappearance but no charges were ever filed in this case. On December 13, 1994, Mary Jane allegedly threatened a co-worker at a Denny's restaurant. Mary Jane was fired as a result. She purchased a Rossi M68 38 caliber revolver that same day. The timing of the purchase is consistent with the idea that Mary Jane may have been thinking about unleashing a Grand Slam revenge. The same year as this incident, Mary Jane joined the Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church. Over the next several years, she largely avoided serious controversy there, despite not fitting in with the other members of the congregation. She was an extremely active volunteer who was always hanging around and talking to people. In March 2005, the church hired a new pastor, a former golf business professional named Greg Shreves. His performance there was a hole-in-one, the congregation grew under his leadership. He frequently interacted with Mary Jane, but found her behavior to be out of bounds. This was par for the course, considering how Mary Jane was a little eccentric. In 2007, the pastor hired a woman named Rhonda Smith to work as the church secretary on a temporary basis. Rhonda had bipolar disorder, which greatly affected her functioning. She had moved in with her parents after dropping out of college due to mental health symptoms. The temporary job at the church was a great boost to her self-esteem and signaled that she was functioning better. Rhonda was extremely grateful for the opportunity and even thanked the entire congregation during a service. Many people thought that Rhonda was making progress with her symptoms. Despite this optimism, Rhonda was still struggling quite a bit in her life. She was dating married men, which attracted a good deal of criticism and concern. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On January 23, 2008, a woman named Judy, who regularly cleaned the Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church twice a week, arrived at the church to clean at about 1 p.m. She was surprised to find the door unlocked. When Judy entered the church, she found Rhonda Smith on the floor in the office. There was blood everywhere. Judy called 911. Rhonda was taken to a hospital where she died shortly afterward. Here is what the police found during the course of their investigation. Rhonda had been shot two times in the head with a 38 caliber revolver. She had shielded her face with her arms before the shooting. No murder weapon was found at the crime scene. The police did not know exactly when the murder occurred, but Rhonda normally used the computer in the church office. All activity on that computer stopped at 10.54 a.m. The police thought that Rhonda's risky behavior of dating married men may have caused a betrayed lover to kill her. It was also possible that this was a robbery gone bad. 
no clear theory of the crime emerged right away. The police spoke to the pastor. He implicated Mary Jane Fonder. The pastor said that Mary Jane had engaged in a series of bizarre behaviors during the time that he knew her. For example, she would put food in the kitchen of the parsonage, presumably for his benefit. After he locked the door, she would leave the food outside. Mary Jane would call him every day and often go on tangents that lasted for hours. After the pastor stopped answering her calls, Mary Jane would fill up his voicemail with long messages. There was one particularly disturbing episode in the fall of 2006. Mary Jane was in the pastor's office talking to him when, out of the blue, she said, You can't deny what is going on between us. The pastor was stunned and responded, Let's not go there. After this, Mary Jane started leaving angry messages for him. The pastor went to the church elders to express his concerns about her, but they told him not to worry about it. Investigators briefly spoke to Mary Jane. She stated that on the day of the murder, she was getting her hair cut in nearby Quakertown. The police went to the salon and examined the sign-in log. Mary Jane signed in at 11.22 a.m. The driving time from the church to the salon was 14 minutes, which gave her enough time to commit the murder and make it to the salon. When the police discovered that Mary Jane had purchased a 38 caliber revolver in 1994, they only became more convinced that she may have been the killer. On February 25, 2008, the police brought Mary Jane in for a formal interview. She talked to them for four hours, mostly about topics unrelated to Rhonda Smith's murder. The officers could not get a word in edgewise. Mary Jane said that she felt as though the church members liked Rhonda Smith better than her. Both of them had financial problems, yet the church members organized a fundraiser for Rhonda. Why didn't they care as much about Mary Jane? This seemed tragically unfair to her. Mary Jane was not a member of the Rhonda Smith fan club. She claimed that Rhonda was romantically involved with the pastor, something that was not supported by the evidence. The police specifically asked Mary Jane about her 38 caliber revolver. She told them that she no longer had the weapon. She had thrown it into a lake the same year she purchased it, 1994. Mary Jane offered two different reasons for this unusual decision. Number one, she was afraid of the weapon. She fired it and could not cope with its power. Number two, the woman who Mary Jane allegedly threatened at the Denny's restaurant specifically mentioned how she brandished a firearm. Mary Jane disposed of the revolver because she was concerned that if the police found it, the discovery would support the accusation against her. When Mary Jane denied her involvement in Rhonda Smith's murder, she switched to a deliberate, low-pitched, and angry voice, which was disturbing to investigators. It was described as just plain evil. Mary Jane became upset and refused to say anything else to the police. The discontinuation of talking behavior was something new for her. The police thought that Mary Jane was the killer, but they didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. On March 29, 2008, a man contacted the police and told them that he was with his eight-year-old son fishing in a nearby lake when his son found a loaded 38 caliber revolver in the water. When the police examined the revolver, they noticed it had the same serial number as the revolver that Mary Jane had purchased in 1994. Tests indicated it was the weapon used to kill Rhonda Smith. On April 1, 2008, Mary Jane Fonder was arrested for the murder of Rhonda Smith. Her trial started on October 21, 2008. On October 30, Mary Jane was found guilty of first-degree murder and possession of an instrument of crime. On December 5, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At her sentencing, Mary Jane said, quote, I did not kill Rhonda Smith. I thought she was a lovely girl, and I certainly wasn't jealous of this woman for any reason. I'm so sorry she's gone, but in the same respect, I will be gone too. I'm the second person in the church to be murdered by the system, unquote. About a year after her conviction, Mary Jane made a curious statement during an interview. She said, quote, I think I might have had something to do with it, with what happened to Rhonda, unquote. Mary Jane did not remember killing her, but she believed that she could do something like that during an episode of emotional dysregulation. Some people view this statement as a confession. Technically, it's not, but when combined with the other evidence, any doubt about Mary Jane's guilt has been removed. 
Mary Jane Fonder died of cardiac arrest on June 4, 2018, at the age of 75. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Mary Jane suffered from mental health symptoms starting from a young age. When she was eight years old, she had what was described as an emotional breakdown. On one occasion, during her high school years, she was placed in a secure mental health facility for about a month. Mary Jane was socially awkward and afraid of crowds. She dropped out of high school. Although she was never married, she did have two serious boyfriends in her life. Both of those relationships failed. During her time at the church in Springfield Township, Mary Jane stood out for her bizarre behavior. She was described as irritating, opinionated, loud, talkative, obnoxious, intrusive, unsophisticated, and offensive. Members of the congregation did their best to tolerate her, but it was extremely difficult at times. Item number two, Mary Jane was the prime suspect in the disappearance of her father, Edward. The police thought that she murdered him and somehow disposed of his body. There was some evidence supporting her guilt. For example, how did Edward wander away given his severe mobility problems? Maybe somebody picked him up in a vehicle, but who would do that and why? A physician stated that Edward could not survive 10 days without his medication. The police found the body of a dog in Mary Jane's freezer. The dog died from an overdose of medication used to treat diabetes. When talking about her father's disappearance, Mary Jane told the police, quote, I don't think I did anything to my pop, unquote. Mary Jane once had an argument with a man who she hired to cut down trees on her property, telling him to avoid one particular area because it was sacred. She referred to it as, quote, the hole from hell, unquote. Edward's pension payments continued after his disappearance, which led to Mary Jane collecting over $60,000. After she was convicted of murder, she agreed to repay all the payments which were received after the seven-year anniversary of her father's disappearance. There were a few factors that pointed away from Mary Jane's guilt. For example, Edward had been talking to a phone sex operator around the time he disappeared. Maybe he ran off with her. And eight months after his disappearance, Edward's wallet was found in a mailbox in Allentown, Pennsylvania. When weighing all the evidence, I think that Mary Jane probably was involved in her father's disappearance but there's no way to know for certain. Item number three, Mary Jane initially found prison to be extremely unpleasant, but eventually she adapted to the environment surprisingly well. She lost 50 pounds and her health improved dramatically. It wasn't all pleasant, however. Mary Jane was plagued by repeated nightmares where Rhonda Smith would appear to her. I imagine this was mostly because of the murder part. Mary Jane appealed her conviction, but in February of 2010, she withdrew her appeal, saying that she could not imagine life outside prison. I guess she had a captive audience who she could subject to her nonstop talking. It's hard not to think of this as cruel and unusual punishment for her fellow inmates. A small group of inmates did come to appreciate Mary Jane Fonder. They thought that she really developed a heart. I guess this just demonstrates how prison may not make the heart grow fonder, but it could make the fonder grow a heart. Moving to my final item, number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Mary Jane had a number of borderline and histrionic traits. She was impulsive, erratic, loquacious, needed to be the center of attention, and would move back and forth between idealizing and devaluing potential romantic partners. She also had traits of vulnerable narcissism, like being vindictive, insecure, and self-centered. Mary Jane could not tolerate any competition. Instead of empathizing with Rhonda Smith, a woman who also had mental health symptoms, Mary Jane became jealous. She falsely believed that Rhonda was romantically involved with a pastor. Mary Jane also falsely believed that she herself was attractive to the pastor. Even though she was accustomed to trying to talk people to death, Mary Jane used her revolver to protect her non-existent romance. Those are my thoughts in the case of Mary Jane Fonder. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.